ask any Tynesiders currently living away what reminds them most of home and many would reply that it is the images around the local river. Enquire about their claim to being Geordies and their answer would almost certainly be because we were born on the banks of the Tyne. Should they return to seek out the places unchanged by progress then they might well be drawn to the Usburn Valley that holds on defiantly to many of its original buildings. When I returned to the area known as the battlefield, I needed an old map to remind me of how it used to be. For Blythe Street and Pond Street, where I lived as a boy, have long since disappeared, along with all the others. Yet I still felt back at home on seeing the surviving parish church of St Dan once again. My first meeting with the local vicar was around the font in September 1928, though I have no memory of it now. Uh, you were baptised? Uh, yes, 1928. 1928, that was what, 73 years ago? 73 years, yes. And you've been back since? Well, a few times. Yes, yeah, that's good. <laughs> now the font uh, behind us is in the southeast corner, where originally it was in the entrance to the church uh -huh. um, at the west end. As you came in the church, if you'd had time to look, you would have seen right in the entrance uh, on the left as you came in, a black and white picture of St. Anne's as it used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it's changed, changed a great deal since the time, hasn't it? It certainly has, yes. And not as many pews as, as it used no, to be. No, that's fine. Well, uh, and that would be said because um, there's been some major work done here. Um, this church was originally built in the 14th century. Uh, and in 1768, it was rebuilt simply because the population around here was growing in size. Mm -hmm. um, what happened was they built on the original foundations here, but in the area where we were sat, they really never thought, according to our architect anyway, to lay as deep foundations as they should have. So you have the result that you have some siphons on the roof. Um, and you can see some of those areas there where there was great subsidence. Um, and we had to spend something like a quarter of a million pounds in 1997. Um, and what we did, we took the opportunity to create a screen here so we could use that bit that you came down where there would be more people in your time as a church hall. And indeed we use it for coffee and for functions. Uh, we had a friend of St. Anne's eating here last week. We used this whole church for the first St. Anne lecture two weeks ago. 110 people here. Mm. We have to use it as a church hall now because the old church hall uh, next door to the church um, has been knocked down as now a modern block of flats. Yes, now, I, rem I remember my mother going to dances in, that, yeah. in, the, in the church hall. Yeah. The funds invested to improve the interior appear to have been well spent, for although there is a reduction in capacity, the congregation can experience a brightness that was so absent in the distant past at the time that my parents came here to be married. All social events in those days took place in the church hall, from weekly Sunday school to evening whist drives and dances, but sadly new housing occupies the site today. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, this event at St. Anne's Church. We call it an old battlefield reunion designed primarily to bring together people who perhaps once lived in the area but are now living in various other parts in the Castleman region. And I hope this afternoon we will indeed meet some old friends, or friends of friends, or friends of neighbours, and um, have a good uh, reminiscence about life here on the battlefield. Um, the people who lived in these streets still depend on the church for their meetings and using the newly acquired social area within the church, local historian Mike Greatbatch often lectures on the past history of the battlefield to an audience that, like myself, would have been christened here and probably married too in later years.
St Anne's Row was the birthplace of Professor John Gilroy, noted painter of the Heads of Europe, and the comic Guinness poster signs too. Maritime painter John Carmichael also worked from the terrace, whose far end house served as St Anne's Vicarage, now also replaced by modern housing. The sight of the church clock was always a comforting reminder that you were on home ground, though few ever saw behind its four faces. For the past two decades, maintenance of the clock movement has been under the care of ex-miner Tommy Webster, and no doubt his experience of reaching nigh inaccessible places underground has equipped him with the skills needed to enter the clock tower. This is St Anne's Church clock. I've looked after this for about 20 years now and I'm finally getting it to its present degree of accuracy. Yeah, and it has to be wound how often? It's wound up twice a week. Yeah, with that? That key you have? This, this is the, this <laughs> is the, it goes in there and you wind it here. And when the weights are fully down, is 150 turns for each uh, drum. There are two drums, this one with a quarter inch, three eight inch rope. That one is the chiming drum. That one is the time drum, the time's up for that. You've got your movement from, well it's been going since 1901 and it's still in perfect condition. For over a hundred years, the battlefield community has benefited from the presence of this symbolic timepiece, and except for the war years, the illuminated clock faces have provided a welcoming beacon for the people of the area. Well here I am standing where 14 Blythe Street used to be, the place of my birth in 1928, and as you look at the houses behind me, you'll see there's been many, many changes made. I was born in my grandparents' house, George and Sally Redmain, and lived there until I was two, after which we moved round the corner into One Pond Street, where I'm going to have a look at next. We lived here at the junction of Pond Street and Coker Street between 1930 and 1936, around the corner from Blythe Street, where I first saw the light of day. On the same street was the shop of Marjim Leclellan, and close by in Wandsbeck Street, the greengrocer Stevie Patterson. The George Galley bus garage was passed on my way to the Shieldfield Board School in Stepney Road. In July 1936, our family moved to Yorkshire, where father had decided to work, and where a newly built bungalow awaited us that mother certainly enjoyed living in and soon a new school for me to attend deep in the Yorkshire countryside. One of those who have remained in the area is 80-year-old Lily Smith. I know you're one of the local residents around here. That's right. Yeah. Your origins are in Tyne Street, aren't they? That's right, yes. And you tell me about Tyne Street. Your, your mother had a shop there, I believe. That's right. And what did she sell? Everything you could think of. <laughs> We sold everything, uh, for perishables and all that sort of thing. Yes, little yeah. bit of fruit and little bit of vegetables. Yes. And bacon and all that sort of thing, and then tinned stuff and whatnot. And where did your customers mainly come from? Mostly from the street. Nearly all from the street. And street. From Miller's Hill at the time. Miller's Hill, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And that was the, the, the part of uh, the battlefield on Newcastle where the big wall was. That's right, but it was uh, never called the battlefield. No, but it was, it was almost, it was, it was adjacent near. to it, yes. yes. And from there you actually moved into the battlefield, moved didn't into you? the battlefield, that's right. The, the street was pulled down. When the, when the council were building houses down at Walker, Sandy, uh, I've forgotten the name of it. Down, they were trying to rehouse you they down into Walker, all, yes. Oh, they were building new houses and they took the whole street down. Yeah, but you didn't want to go. We didn't want to no. go down there. No. So you moved so we into, went into the battlefield. You went into the battlefield and that, into Pond Street. Into Pond Street. Yeah, where I lived as a two-year-old. Well, I was in number 62. 
Right. right at the bottom. Right at the far right. end, yes. Uh -huh. huh? And then after that we came up into Coker Street because my grandmother had a, two houses there and the person that was upstairs moved out so we moved in there. And, and what, what, what memories do you have of, of life in this area then? What special very, stories? Very good, very good memories. Huh? What can you tell us? Well, we still went to Jubilee School along the road uh -huh. here. And they went to St Anne's Church, yes. down the back, down the back street there. Though the churchyard was originally intended as a burial ground, it has had many other uses since. A garden of peace for the elderly and playground for local children. The church stands on Bremish Street, opposite the old Pont Street, Bremish Street corner, where a completely new housing development replaced the old streets of the battlefield in 1968. On the corner of Crawhall Road stands a new pharmacy that in my day was the local post office. All right, thank you. I used to come in here nearly 70 years ago on a Friday night. Really? Friday night was pay night. And my mother used to bring me along when this was the Howard Street post office. That's right. A tiny little shop on the corner here. Mm. And typically she'd buy me a box of lead soldiers. How long have you been here then? Well, we've just been here over 12 months. Um, we moved down from St Anne's Close and we had the building built uh, especially for uh, ourselves. And uh, we're very pleased with the high profile site we've got here. You certainly made a splendid job of it. Thank you very much. Well, the amount of stock you've got is quite surprising. And are you happy living and working in the battlefield? Yes, it is. It's quite a challenge because, you know, the area is developing and growing. Yeah. And with the quayside expanding all the time, you know, I think the pharmaceutical needs will uh, increase similarly. Yeah. And hopefully we'll be able to cope with that and do them a good uh, service. I can't see you ever being short of customers. Thank you. Thank you for talking to us today. No, it's a great pleasure. Gibson Street had a reputation for toughness and up which no stranger would venture alone. Yet it was visited weekly by children from miles around for the Saturday afternoon matinees of Tom Mix, Tarzan and other childhood film heroes who temporarily eased the pain of the classroom from their ardent followers. Local children attended the Royal Jubilee School on City Road including 92-year-old Betty Joyce, who still lives but a short distance from where it once stood. Now, now Betty, yes. I understand you were born on Stepley Bank and then you moved into the mill yard. Exactly. What exactly. was the reason What was the reason for that? The reason was I had a very, very old grandmother who was ill. And in those days, there was no hospitals to put anybody in at all. It's only since this last war they realised that people have got to have hospitals. Otherwise you're nursing you your people in the house and it's not giving them a chance. No. And you see, she was one of these, she had a very bad temper. And if she could get a coat on, she'd go out and she'd wander all around the place. And we discovered she wasn't in the house, we were all around looking for her. And she went out at night time when it was dark, oh dear me, my poor mother, oh, I felt sorry for my mother at times. Because she had these two bad legs to start with, poor soul. And I, as a child, used to dress these legs, you know, for the and things, you know. Mm -hmm. But this old grandmother was really, really bad tempered. You had to watch her like mad. This was your grandmother? My grandmother. Your grandmother, yes. My uh -huh. mother's mother. Uh -huh. What were living conditions like in Miller's Yard? Well... Compared to what you might expect today? Considering there were so many people lived in it, it was pretty good. Because if anybody was ill, everybody helped. If there was a funeral, everybody helped. They brought a china for your cup of tea. All this sort of thing. Yes, yeah. And at Christmas, we used to get an old tub, fill it with all the rubbish you could think of, get a pole somewhere, stick it in, get the lines, those lines, and put them across the yard and you put your de Christmas decorations on. Outside in the yard? Outside in yes. the yard. Yeah. 
If the weather was bad, well, that was just too bad. Mm. And did you have running water in the house? No. So it where did you get your water from then? Well, a tap was halfway down in the yard. Outside? Outside. Uh, in the and winter as well, you had to go outside. Yeah. Mm. And there was a great big sink, which all the water from the washing and everything went in. Uh -huh. If anybody put anything else down, not to go and clean it out. Mm -hmm. and didn't get off with it. And no doubt your toilets were out in the yard as well, were they? Yes, they were all yeah. here, all down one side. Yeah. And you all took your turn. And you went out in the dead of night to the toilet? You uh, had to. Yeah. You couldn't mm -hmm. have their toys. Now, as a young boy, I remember walking across Biker Bridge and looking down into, the, into Miller's yard. And there was concert parties going on. Would and be. people used to throw pennies down. Do, yes. you, do you remember that I, happening? I'll tell you how we had concerts and things. This auntie, she was married to my father's brother, she played a concertina. If she was living now, she would make a fortune. She was fantastic. She could play any tune, she could hear it once. She could pick her own melody up and away it would go. The kid were knocking on her door at 8 o'clock on a Saturday night. Mrs. Trice, are you going to come out? She used to come out, bring a stool or a tray, and a load in. The kids were still dancing at two o'clock in the morning. They could, the mother couldn't get them to bed. Right. <laughs> this is the mill yard area today, where the street performers earned their pennies. And close by the Tanner's Arms, where at least some of their profits would have been happily spent. Next door was the original Mark Tony ice cream factory. In 1933, a delegation came from London to No. 1 Pont Street to see for themselves my father's success in building his own bed television receiver, these surviving items being part of the setup in my bedroom that produced those early moving pictures that attracted the local audiences I can still remember. Even a few notes on its construction still exist, mentioning a notice in St Anne's Parish Church magazine that caused quite a stir on Tyneside. He's always a brainy pilly, a pilly, you know. Yes, so people say. We don't know this. <laughs> right. Now, Bob, yeah. one of the surprising things you've told me is that you lived in Pond Street. Pond Street, that's right. Two houses in Pond Street. I lived exactly in the same I, street that I lived in. 38 and 28. And we lived in number one. Mm -hmm. And another surprise you have for me is that you actually worked with my father. He yeah, did. Yeah. And when I asked you, do you ever remember seeing television in the battlefield? You say yes, you did. I didn't see it. No, but you no, know but I, I knew all about it. Yeah, and whose was that? Harry Steenson. Harry Steenson, my father. The father, um, yes. And I, I also hear at the time that there was a notice in the St Anne's Parish magazine telling people that uh, it, it was being shown. Uh -huh. And it actually was set up in my bedroom. But you, you have a memory of people coming to see it as well, don't oh, you? Oh, both sides of the street were, were a load of cars. You couldn't, you couldn't get moved for cars. In, in Pond Street? In Pond Street. And that must have both caused, sides of the street. That must have caused quite a sensation. Oh, well it was in them days. There was very few cars. Well, mm -hmm. that was a lot of, quite a few, but yeah. how, not half as many as we have it today. No, well, we, we had one. We had a Ford 8, 1936 Ford uh, 8 uh, Y model, I believe. But on that particular day, you say the street was, was oh, full of it was, cars. It was. Mm. And another thing that surprises me is that you didn't go to the same school as me. You say you went to the oh, Royal, went to Royal Jubilee. Royal Jubilee, yes. Yeah. I often wondered why did some of us go to uh, Stepney Lane and some to the Royal Jubilee. Well, I went to the best school, you see. That was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you, you, you worked alongside my father. You were both, well, my father was an electrician by that time, uh, and you were his apprentice. Uh -huh, but I didn't finish it. I didn't finish as an electrician. Well, you didn't stay. I went as a docker. You went down and worked on the dock. And, and, and yeah. the case aid. And that was where my maternal grandfather worked. That's right. Mm -hmm. And his name? Jody Gay, Jody Redman. Redman, yeah. So you, you knew him. Oh, I knew him very well. And, and Sally, my grandmother. Yes. That was very interesting. And Sally, I always called her Dolly. No, that was my mother. Oh, that was your mother. Yeah, that's, yeah. Oh, that's how you're talking about Jody's wife. Yeah. That's yes, right. Yeah. Right. So uh, Harry Steenson came over from Gateshead and... Uh, his, his father had a shop 
in Gateshead. That's right. You had a shop in... Uh, on the High Street. On the High Street in yes. Gateshead, yes. That's you, right. met, you met my mother in the Oxford. Oh, yes. Yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm the result of that uh, uh, union. Uh -huh. And they were married in... What a shame. <laughs> <laughs> they were married in St Anne's Church and uh, uh, I was christened there too. The battlefield lived up to its name in the spring of 1941 when parts of Blythe Street and Tarset Street were destroyed in an air raid. At this end of Tarset Street, an act of bravery by 12-year-old Boy Scout Ernest Smith, who lived in nearby Bremy Street, was reported in the local paper. Well, it was a young girl cutting over the bomb buildings, over the bomb site, where the house had been, and I'd build it in. And the ground collapsed. You found it a crater about 10 or 12 feet deep. Mm -hmm. My brother was passing earnest. He volunteered to go down on a clothes leg to tie it around and load him in. Right. He took it up to tie it around her, but he collapsed. And the fire brigade rode up. The fireman went down. He done the same thing, took the rope up to tie on, and he fell, you know, he collapsed. All right, yes. The tumbler was gas and you know, was, the hole was full of gas. Yeah, this is a crater left by the bomb. Oh my. Mm -hmm. Had to get a full rescue squad in then, like, you know, the breathing operators right. to get them out, like, you know, but by then they were all dead, like, you know. They'd all been lost. Yeah. Know, yeah. George's brother Ernest, though better known as Sonny, was posthumously awarded the Boy Scouts highest award for heroism with their bronze cross. The London Gazette also recognised his bravery with an official mention on September the 12th, 1941. Across the street from that crater, the original Scots transport yard is still used for that purpose but the flat horse-drawn carts and lorries that were once a familiar sight are not to be seen in Bremer Street anymore. Right Beatrice, yes. 85 years old. That's right. Or 85 years young by the look of you. And you too were born in the battlefield. That's right. Where was I that? Was five Bremer Street, the other end of where I am now. Which is not too far away really, no, is it? No, no. And as a young girl you would find things to do in the area. What? What particular yes. things interested you in those days? Well, we used to go to the church hall, we used to dance, I ran a brownie troop, we used to go to the swimming baths at the top of Crow Hall Road near Bridge Street, uh, and just otherwise, just kick around the locality, go to the lop. I went to Jubilee School, and they had a wonderful football team and a swimming team. Uh -huh. And how, how long did you stay in the battlefield? How long did you live here then? Until I was 17. And then, and then we moved to Sandyford. You moved to Sandyford when you were 17? 17. Mm -hmm. Now from memory, Beatrice, there were a lot of small hauliers in the battlefield because my great-grandfather had a hay and corn business at the end of Oost Street and Cut Bank. And I believe that your family too were connected with the Holdridge business. Holdridge people, that's right. Well, what did they that's do right. then? Well, they used to take anything. They used to go as far as Pontil in those days with bags of flour and stuff on the wagons. On a horse and cart? On a horse and cart. Mm, yes. uh, uh, there were flat carts with four wheels. Other ones just had two wheels. And where was the where was the office centre? The office centre was on the milk market on Newcastle Quay's side, and was only a wooden hut. And did you ever visit there? Oh yes, I was carried there and put in a drawer while my man done the bookkeeping. Put in a drawer. Put in a drawer because we hadn't a prop. That stopped you running around and disturbing the workers. That's worker. right. That's right. Well, I was I was only a baby. Sixteen. And do you remember? You know? Do you remember any of this? No. You don't. It's just no. what the family have told no. you. Just what I've been told by the lot of them. Of course, I'm the last one left. 
all my brothers and sisters has gone. Yeah, my mum and dad's gone. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't think I've got any relations. Yeah. You're looking, you're looking very well. <laughs> and we've been pleased to talk to you today. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. The old streets are now but memories to the past residents who were rehoused in Shieldfield House. But in their place and enjoying a garden setting are the homes that replaced them, looking down onto trees, carefully tended lawns and in a traffic free environment. The Usburn Valley too has been enormously improved. Who could imagine that an area once used as a council refuse tip could be transformed into such an attractive place? An equestrian arena now adjoins the old Usburn culvert entrance so I walked up Stepney Bank to learn more about it. I've just been having a look round the Usburn for the first time for many years. I was very surprised to see horses in an outdoor arena. And I understand that you are in charge of this stable on Stepney Bank that I hadn't even heard about. What can you tell me about it? <laughs> well, it's got a very long history. Um, it's always, always been a horse yard um, involved in the transport business. Then it was closed for a long time and the Biker City Farm had two donkeys and a group of horse mad teenagers that decided they wanted a few horses. Uh -huh. Identified a site up just up the bank and um, also the outdoor arena site uh, put in for an application to the sports lottery I think originally. Uh, the paper, paperwork's all lost because when I, t when I took over in 94 there was very very few records that mm -hmm. were left. and. Um, they got, the, they got the, the grant for the four, four stables, four horses and an outdoor arena. Who uses the school then, mainly? Who, who, main, are main, who, on, who I saw on the horses, who are they? Who are these children? Ma mainly youngsters from the east and west end of Newcastle. Certainly people that would never, ever, ever have got the chance to, to horse ride because you need a car, you need money, uh, you, you know, it's an elitist sport because yes. um, it does cost you know, vast, vast amounts, mm -hmm. and that uh, immediately excludes the majority of people from it. Right. So these are kids from the local area. Um, some of them have a history. Um, some of them are what the authorities would describe at risk, and some of them are just the average kid. It's mm -hmm. a good, balanced mix, and it works really well because mm -hmm. they, they want to be there. So they have to work side by side. There's adults with learning difficulties. Yeah. There's some that do have physical disabilities. Mm -hmm. And if they want to stay at the stables, then they, they have to work together. And I have to say they do that really well. Mm -hmm. Now, you tell me that apart from the children at, at the riding school, you've got a few adults who work up there as well. No doubt among them, there must be some characters. Is, is there anyone who immediately springs to mind? Oh, absolutely. If you come up to the stables, the first person that would spring to my mind is Jackie Martin, and you must have a word with him. Okay, I'll do that. <laughs> hey, get. Well, I was actually born in Richmond Street, number one. That's when you're a couple of hundred yards off the battlefield. Yeah. And of course, uh, I lived with me Granny Martin, uh, Granny Timney first. She had a fish shop attached to the house and we had like a room above the fish shop with me granny and my parents right. and whole family, the rest of them. And which school would you go to then from? Royal that? Jubilee. Royal Jubilee. That's, that's where the Salvation Army is now. Yeah, that's all been Jubilee, Jubilee Road. Mm, yeah. And church? Uh, St. Anne's where I was christened. You are christened in St. Anne's? Yeah. Street. Uh -huh. what, what other people can you remember from that period? Well, without names, I knew a lot of faces when I was a kid, running about the block, etc. 
and their neighbours in general, but a lot of them are dead now. Yeah, and can you remember what games you played as a youngster? Oh, played all sorts of mad kiddie and you along the spillers, just for a fun and jump on the kids' back and jump on the railway wagons and knock your nine door. <laughs> a bit of string on somebody's yeah. knocker, just keep pulling and pulling, you know, when they come round to the door. Right. They couldn't see the bit of thread. But it used to annoy them and of course we used to laugh at when he kids games, you know. And at the end of Bremish Street, there was a, a haulage contract of Scots. Yes. And I expect you used to hang on the back of the wagons, did you? Horse and carts, well, I. Horse and carts and the... In fact, the yard's still there yet. That's right. With the arch piece. And the drivers used to whip you. Well, shock you, you know, I mean, you know, whatever. You whip, yes. God depends which drivers there were. Some would let you ride if they knew you. Mm -hmm. But if you thought you were like a, a mischievous one, it's a chase you. Yeah. <laughs> A balloons celebration day at the Stepney Bank Stables and Jackie makes sure that all is correct for a presentation that is soon to take place. Jackie left school at 14 to work as a chain horse driver so he's well accustomed to making these preparations not yet knowing that he is to be part of them himself. All the excitement is due to a donation from the Sport England Lottery Fund that will provide the stables with its own indoor arena. And finally, personal expression of appreciation to Jackie. Thanks, everybody. Jack of all trees, don't you? Oh, I've got to get everything here. Oh, I'll have a look at it. We need your approval on it. Oh, I'll get in front of a minute there. Let's have a look at it. Turn by the back end. Oh, nice. Nice deal. Hey, that was good, wasn't it? Seen two inches of it, and I don't know what it was. My next meeting was with the heritage manager of the Usburn Partnership. The Usburn Valley is one of the most historic sites within Newcastle upon Tyne. For something like 250 years it was the industrial heartland of the city. And it was here that you had the heavy industries such as the lead works, the glass works and the potteries of course, the most famous being mailing pottery which, which everybody on Tyne's side uh, knows something about. Um, I think it's important to remember though that with this heavy industry here there was also literally tens of thousands of people down living in the valley or adjacent to the valley. It was an important uh, place for both work and domestic life. A lot of people lived down here. And my project, the Usburn Heritage Project, uses people who lived and worked down here to tell the history of the locality. We interview people. We work with people to organise special events and we publish an illustrated magazine that reflects the lives of those people and the experiences in the Usburn Valley. I think if you want to understand the uh, value of the Usburn, the best thing to do is actually get out there and walk through the valley because there are a number of locations and features that reflect the history and character of the area. For example, Biker City Farm, which is actually celebrating its 25th year, is just a short distance from where we are now. There's also, very important of course, the actual burn itself in the key wall. And what's really nice is that we have a boat club who's very active here in the valley. And with a bit of luck, they may actually be able to take us out in one of the boats. But there's one feature that you can't see because it's hidden. It's actually underground and it's a very unique feature. And that's the historic Victoria Tunnel. And you know, I think before we do anything else, that's the place where we ought to go first. Fascinating place. Well, this is one of the most 
mean, this tunnel was built, of course, to carry coal in the 1840s, but was completed by 1841 and in operation from 1842 onwards. I think it's tremendous that all of this brickwork and stonework that you see was brought right. into the tunnel and survived all that time. Yeah. And why, why bother to build a tunnel under the city when they could have taken it over land? because of the opposition of some of the town council members and also they were going to be charged what were known as whaleys, which is like a rent for crossing people's land. And the colliery owners, Mr Porter and Mr Latimer, did not want to be uh, paying annual rents forevermore. So the easiest right, and cheapest yeah. thing, ironically, was to tunnel two and a half miles underground. So they're saving money by digging the tunnel, in fact? In the long yes, term, yeah. certainly, but obviously not in the short term. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. And what, what do we see here then on the... Well, I think the, the important thing is that obviously they tunnelled for two and a half miles through clay and then they lined that clay with a stone floor on which the rails sat and then stone wall topped up with a, with a brick arch. And obviously if you're going to be tunnelling through clay and then lining it with stone and brick, the, when they've sent the wagons of coal down there's a tremendous vibration during the first sort of six to twelve months that they were operating. And you can see evidence of where this brickwork is settled. I mean, it's just two courses of brick deep, that's all it is. And then beyond us is just clay, and then eventually, obviously, buildings mm. above us. And it's not likely to fall in today? No, most certainly it's not. <laughs> <laughs> now then, it has, an, it has a, it's had another use, of course. It was during the war, it, it was used as an air raid shelter, wasn't it? It was. So how did people get into here? Yes, during the war, it was used as an air raid shelter. And the city council engineers estimated that 9,000 people could shelter in this tunnel at any one time. Now, I doubt if 9,000 ever did shelter at any one time, but certainly can, when you consider that you're something like 55 to 60 feet beneath the road surface between New Bridge Street and uh, the Hancock Museum at the bottom of Claremont Road, it's a good depth to shelter people yeah. from aerial bombing. And certainly here in sort of Battlefield and the Shieldfield area, what people always recollect is the night that the goods station received a direct hit from a mm -hmm. landmine. Mm -hmm. And I've spoken to people who, who were down here in the tunnel at the time, 55 to 60 feet beneath the road surface, and yet they still felt a vibration and a shudder mm -hmm. when that yeah. bomb went off. Well, I was down here uh, the night that Heaton was bombed, Northview, Cheltenham Terrace and Guildford Place. Mm -hmm. I was on holiday with my grandparents, and I spent a few hours down here that night. Right. Well, we're back in the daylight now, so why don't we visit the Biker Farm that I mentioned earlier? Situated immediately below Biker Bridge, on the site of the old Northumberland Lead Works, the farm recently celebrated its first 25 years, during which time local children have had the opportunity of studying farm animals when getting into the countryside hasn't been quite so easy. A large stock of both farm and domestic favourites normally enjoy the freedom of the valley pastures, but the foot and mouth scourge of recent times has confined them to their various pens and stalls until the outbreak has been finally controlled and the public allowed back onto the premises once again. Much of the care given to the stock has been provided by unpaid volunteers, among them a number of children who simply enjoy this farmyard atmosphere. Now all of the houses that once stood around the Ship Inn have long since gone, but we are fortunate in that there are a lot of people who lived in these properties that have very vivid memories of what life was like here at the bottom of Stepney Bank and the corner of Lime Street around this very important public house, the Ship Inn. OK, well today I'm here to speak to Jim Hay, who lived down in the Usburn. In fact, he lived right next door to the Ship Inn at the bottom of Stepney Bank. Tell me, Jim, where exactly did you, did you live down there? Uh, number 16, Stepney Bank, uh, next door to the Ship Inn on the upstairs flat. And was it a particularly big flat? No, 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 just uh, two rooms, uh, the living room and, uh, and one bedroom at the back. But actually, we did most of the sleeping in the, in the big room because uh, the back room, we were frightened of people jumping off the bridge up behind the Baker Bridge. So this is people committing suicide? Yes, yes, yes. And they'd hit your roof? 
Well, not 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 always that was it. Used to the, the street went down at the bottom and then like an L at the bottom. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And those ones were actually directly under the bridge. Most of them fell there, but one or two would come in. You know, near nearby us. So we kept uh, we kept to the front room and slept in there. So what period are we talking about? When was uh, this? Early thirties. Thirty from you know I, th I was born twenty six so. From the early 30s, I'd be, you know, see a 7 or 8, that, that age, you know, 34, 35, 36. So was that a regular occurrence? It seems well, well, tragic well, to well, uh, well, it seemed to be pretty regular, yes. I can still remember um, the chap's name who went up quite a few times, Jock, Jock Connolly. Lived, he lived in that part of the back where we I'm talking about, where the yeah. L was. Yeah. He, yeah. he lived at the back of us, you see. Sure. And Jock... Uh, he used to get the ladder out, and uh, some of them were stuck halfway through, the, the halfway through, you know, yes. into the tiles and that, and you know, a big hole in the roof. And Jock would go up and uh, and carry them down on his shoulder. Right, right. Uh huh. What, what, what was the pub like then? The ship in? Oh, the ship next door. Well, that was uh, managed by uh, Mr. Heslop, because I used to I used to play with his with one of his well his son uh, Arthur Arthur Heslop. Used to take me in there now and then, and you know, go in the pub and up upstairs in the living room, but downstairs as much as I can remember, because I mean I was you know, I wasn't old enough to go in the bar, but uh, there was just the bar, and then one one room where they where me you know I mean with their name and all our friends used to get. Uh, and the only thing I can remember about it is if a weekend, you know, when they did have a few bob. Uh, then I would come toddling out at 10 o'clock, that was Chuck new time then, singing and you know, shouting and carrying on. And so Jim, um, can you remember who your neighbours were or who your school friends were when you lived down the bank? Yeah, well, uh, on my side of Stepney Bank, up, you know, up over, there was uh, the McElroys, Atkinsons, Trumans, uh, Lawses, uh, and, and then over the other side, like the Connollys, where I've told you about the chap going up the ladder. You know. But when you went across the over the Little Burn Bridge, mm -hmm. here there was a, a full street, both sides of houses. Uh, there was uh, the Browns, Alfie Brown, who I went to school with. You might have a word with him, he might be still around. Jim Hay and Alfie Brown both grew up in this particular area here, Oosburn Road and the bottom of Stepney Bank. But of course today, all the houses are gone. It's completely open space, and all we've really got are their vivid recollections and anecdotal memories. I'm Alfie Brown, and I'm standing more or less at the place where I was born, down Oosburn Road. This is roughly the spot where the front door of the house where I was born was. Uh, to the right, there's a load of trees at the banks of the river which were never there in my days. I never, never knew there'd be trees down Oosburn Road, but there was only one tree where I can remember, and we called it Mary Ellen's Tree, which was at the other end of the little bridge behind us, Crawford's Bridge, grown out of the wall, which we used to climb when we were kids, but Mary Ellen looked after it as it belonged to her. In my childhood, I went to, I went to a school which was just behind me, to me right here, called Sheffield School. It wasn't too far away. There was a, a Dumpney's, it's now Dumpney's Paintworks. It used to be Dumpney's Paintworks. Besides that, uh, when we used to pass our time away, uh, the nearest picture house was uh, the old lop on Gibson Street. But the proper name of it was a picture drum. But we knew it better as a lop. Because when you come out, you've done a lot of scratching. And that's why we called it the lop. Well, I was one of 14 children, my mother had down here. I can remember seven of us, and times were pretty hard because my father was out of work from he was about 48, 49 years of age. So to make money for the likes of the lop where I was talking about before, we used to go around doing little jobs and chopping sticks and selling them to the neighbours around the door. Across the road right in front of us, where I'm standing, there used to be a woman called Lizzie Finnerin, who's a real devout Catholic. And uh, you can imagine down a burn in them days, gas wasn't all in all the houses, and she used paraffin lamps. 
and we used to run along to Popper Wells shop, which was through the bridges there in front of us, Baker Bridge, to Baker Bank, to Potter Wells shop, to get the paraffin for her lamps. And we used to get paid off for a halfpenny, an old halfpenny, which is worth nothing according to the pence in the, the money today. And maybe it's two caramels, which you got from Mary Ellen's shop. It's nice to be back once more down in Wisborne. When I look around now and seeing all the trees, and it's really nice. It's really brought the country back to Wisborne. I would have never thought it would have been like this, because in my days it was all built on. There was factories and pubs and oh, it was houses. And it, it's amazing to think that the, the heritage people is doing such a nice job down here. And I, and I think it's great. As a matter of fact, I've always said to the wife, I would love to win the pools and have a house built down the burn. I'll be back to my roots where I belong. Looking across the once heavily industrialised Usburn Valley, it is obvious that many of the old labour intensive businesses have long since disappeared, having been replaced by a larger number of smaller and cleaner factory units of more modern design. One company that started trading with barrows and push carts just before the Second World War has survived the many changes, continuing the business today with the use of rather more sophisticated equipment than its founders used. Though still using the family name, it was recently taken over by another company after having been in the Shepherd family for many, many years. Close by the Shepherd Yard, a cluster of smaller companies still make their contribution to the consumer market. Once the home of many working families, all of the old Lime Street housing is now history, and standing across the road from the partially demolished flax mill chimney can be seen the only dwellings to have replaced those of this once heavily populated region of Newcastle upon Tyne. The Cumberland Arms enjoys a commanding view of the ancient scenes below, where a new use has been made of what was once the Clooney bonded warehouse. Standing here adjacent to the Usburn itself, we can see how the former industrial buildings were designed and located to face onto the Usburn and they're built right on the edge of the quay wall. This was so that the raw materials could be brought up the burn by barges and boats and finished products could be loaded direct from the buildings back onto the boats and out onto the time. The two buildings behind me are amongst the finest examples of the industrial heritage of the Lower Usburn. The building that stands on the bend in the river is a warehouse that was built in the 1870s but it will shortly become the home for the Centre for the Children's Book, a major educational and activity centre here in the Usburn. Now the really significant thing about this part of the Lower Usburn of course is the fact that it's tidal by the River Tyne. And when the tide is out and the water level is low, which is, it is at the minute, then it provides a really good opportunity for the boat owners, members of the Usburn Boat Club, to repair and repaint their various pleasure boats that they have here. But of course when the tide is in and the depth of the water is really high and deep, then what better opportunity to actually take a trip down the Usburn and out to the River Tyne. So why don't we do that?
back in 1927, it was here in Buxton Street that film and television comedian Jack Douglas first came into the world. It's strange to think back to the days of Newcastle on Tyne because it was a very interesting story because my mother uh, was a Geordie and at eight months pregnant she travelled to Newcastle especially so that I wouldn't be born on foreign soil. And I remember going to my grandfather's house in Buxton Street, which was like a miner's cottage you know, with a bed in the wall. And uh, what little I remember that was amazing. Um, we're a strange race, Geordies. We're very clannish, and we certainly love everything that we have up there, and with good cause, because it's a lovely part of the world. But Buxton Street, to me, I remember when I went back many years later to do a television in Newcastle, and they did some press pictures at Buxton Street with me in the cap and glasses and the overalls and the boots. And, of course, it's now office blocks. And I looked at where my grandfather's cottage was and saw this rising <laughs> block of offices, and there was a touch of sadness there. But I remember once going to do a commercial, and I went in, and this young director said to me, ah, he said, now, you know this is to do with uh, pies and sausages? I said, yes. And he said, just a minute, you're not a Geordie. I said, yes, I am. He said, but you don't talk like a Geordie. And I said, you switch that red light on, and I soon will. And of course, he switched the light on. I said, no, I'd like to tell you one or two things mainly about these sausages and pies. I said to her, the most important thing is if you get these pies, get stuffed pies. And he said, that's not quite right. I said, no, but I think it's funny. <laughs> so it's, it's been a very interesting life in show business. And I've just actually now uh, finished writing my life story of, are you ready, 60 years in show business. So that'll be coming out shortly, and when it does, it'll uh, awaken a lot of my ex geordie friends and fans, but interesting so. Well, I hope you go well up uh, Buxton Street Way and the battlefield, and uh, I hope with any luck that I'll be able to come up and have a look round and see what you're doing up there. So may I just say thank you for inviting me, and to all of you up there, keep fit and well like you da. Thank you. Goodbye. The time of Jack Douglas's birth was 1927 when the Sunday Quayside market was an important part of many people's social calendar. By 1928, the building of the new Tyne Bridge was well underway and was planned to relieve the increasing congestion on the Swing Bridge. King George V officially opened the bridge on October the 10th after being presented to the Mayor and Mayoress of Gateshead by the Lord Lieutenant of Durham, Lord Londonderry. The King and Queen later went on to further civic duties, whilst cars and lorries sounded their horns, ships blew their hooters, and crowds thronged onto the bridge that had taken three years to complete. Into the 50s, and the Sunday market is as popular as ever and always busy, for the stallholders are only allowed to trade between the hours of 11am and 2.30pm, so there's no time to be lost if you've come here looking for bargains. But we must believe that most are here only to soak up the atmosphere. The original soap factory of Thomas Headley, later acquired by Procter & Gamble, was one of many either demolished or renovated in 1993 to start the regeneration of the quayside, a scheme that not only changed the business structure of the riverside, but the social content of it too, and in 1993 the arrival of the tall ships for the beginning of the Cutty Sark race to Bergen 
had added even more colour to the changes. During the week of the tall ship's visit, the quayside became the busiest place in the region, attracting many thousands from all over Britain, eager to enjoy the sighting of both the ships and their crews, coming here from across the world. Directly in line with Jack Douglas's Buxton Street, we find 49 Howard Street, birthplace of James Alder. Well, most people will have heard of, seen the pictures of, and even attended some of the lectures of James Alder. But I wonder how many people realise that you were born on, shall we say, the borders of the battlefield? Yes, uh, that's accurate. I was born on the west side of Crowhall Road. If you crossed Crowhall Road, you were in the battlefield. But in fact, Crowhall Road was a very important demarcation line. It led down from Shield Field, more or less, almost straight down to the banks of the Tyne, the very centre of our boyhood territory. Now, my memory of the quayside was especially on a Sunday morning, because the rest of the week, most of the rest of the week were at school, but Sunday mornings, I would go out and down to the quayside, down to the quayside market. What were your memories of, of a Sunday in that part of the world? Well, like you, it certainly was the, the quayside market with its ice cream and its chocolates and its entertainment by these um, escapologists and the man offering a guaranteed, win <laughs> guaranteed winners and the horses, you know. There was a, there was a coloured man dressed in a sort of Indian headgear, I remember. He was quite famous in his time, I forget his name. I got a horse, he used to shoot. Yes, I remember the sounds and smells of... But that was just the beginning of the day to, to we boys. The, uh, the Sunday was a free, a free day to us. And once we'd experienced the quayside and had our ice cream cone and then went back for a bite of lunch, the rest of the day, the afternoon, some of us went to Sunday school occasionally, but not many. The temptations of the great game, <laughs> what it all about. And that wonderful territory, Crowhall Road running down the quayside and left and right, you know, going down to the Oosburn and right up to the, the, the Tyne Bridge, the new Tyne Bridge. So inspiration from the quayside on Sundays, could you tell me what was the main attraction on a Saturday afternoon? living in that part of the world. <laughs> oh, yes, of course, the lop. <laughs> yes, yes, it was, it, it, we had to go there. there, there every, and, and of course, there was always a cowboy, a possibly a pirate film on. And when we came out after the, 
somehow I remember it always being a bright sunny day. It was the fact you it was a matinee, you came out the darkness and obviously it was so bright it must mm. have been sunny, maybe even raining, you know. Yeah. But we came out and we were always galloping, patting our backsides as if we were riders yeah. on horses. It would have been a cowboy. <laughs> That's yeah. right. And we were all immediately the film the the leader of the gang always got the the name of the hero cobo of the time, and we all shared different names, you know. Yeah, but how how did how did that background lead you into being a painter? Uh, yes, a, a good question. Uh, to think that no, I'm known as a bird and a flower painter from Tyneside, but the only birds that we saw were sparrows and the, the pigeons, the wild pigeons, and, a, and gulls, and occasional cormorant. Uh, it was, I suppose, my teacher finding out that I could draw at school when I was 12 years old and my hard headmaster looking at my collection of drawings I'd done at home from the age of five and six. He was amazed to find this collection. He immediately sent me out equipped with a satchel to wander around the key, the quayside, literally. Every day while I was at school I was permitted to go out. And it was then I rediscovered the quayside not just a place of adventure, but the, the romance of drawing it, of art, of meeting kindly Geordies who would tower above me and say, mm. have you got the church steeple quite vertical, you know? And I know he wasn't criticising, he was trying to help. And I gained the mm. communion with those people yes. and matured very, very quickly in a different way. Well, James, from your very early days, it's obvious that your, your life is going to be centred around the painting of birds. You travelled the world looking at the birds of other nations. Nearer home, you were a freelance artist and writer for the local Evening Chronicle newspaper. You then went on to design porcelain models of birds for Royal Worcester. But there must be one special achievement in your life which stands out above all of the others. What would that be? It's got to be my last effort, which was my two books, one for Her Majesty the Queen Mother and one for Her Majesty the Queen, Books of Birds and Flowers. And is this one of the books? And this, see this, is one of them. this is one of them yeah. here. This is the Queen Mother's book. And are you going to show it to us? I'd like to very much. Well, let's have a look. I enjoyed doing this portrait of Her Majesty the Queen Mother as a little girl of nine or ten. She loaned me an old black and white photograph and uh, here it is she's uh, enjoying herself as a little one girl tea party in the grounds of her the castle and though we see her majesty perhaps 95 years old sitting in the drawing room in the, in the palace St James's palace in London and I beside her and she's saying to me, as she's touching the paintings, you're good at these fellas, aren't you? Well, I'm thrilled at that little compliment. She's great fun. Glass of water. That's, very, all that. that's very kind. You're very thoughtful, Lillian. Thank you. The western end of the quayside has mainly escaped the city planners, and here can be seen the old guild hall, now an office block, with the Bessie Surtees house standing behind it. One of Newcastle's oldest hostelries, the Cooperage, is close by the Bessie Surtees house, around which many tales have been woven, some of which may bear an element of truth needed to correct the many other legends. Down river, we see the results of recent developments, with cafes, bars and hotels replacing the metal storage sheds and crumbling buildings. The old co-op warehouse 
being just one example of what can be achieved with the survivors. The blacksmith's needle displays examples of the most traditional Tyneside industries. Standing beside the swell pavilion on which the destination names appear of the cargo ships at once traded here on an almost daily basis to the principal ports of Europe and sometimes even to the other side of the world. Still attracting its Sunday crowds, the Quayside market continues to flourish, though the mix of traders and entertainers is no more. Escapologists, racing tipsters and auctioneers have all disappeared, leaving behind stalls that seem to have little more than clothing to offer. William Armstrong's hydraulically operated swing bridge built to allow the passage of warships up to his armament works at Scotswood and Elsick is open much less often today. But when it is used, it is for much more peaceful purposes as the river cruise boats take passengers up and down the river on sightseeing journeys. The Gateshead Millennium Bridge, designed only for the use of cyclists and pedestrians, was officially opened by the Mayor and Mayoress of Gateshead in September of 2001. And like the Swing Bridge, it too opens to allow the passage of ships, but in a rather different way, as we shall see later. For now the Gateshead and Newcastle parties unite, crossing the bridge together, after which the public are encouraged to follow in their footsteps. May the 7th in 2002 was a rather special day for both the river and the people of Tyneside. For on this Tuesday, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, accompanied by Prince Philip, came on her Golden Jubilee tour to royally perform the final official opening of the Gates of Millennium Bridge. The Newcastle onlookers waited at the north end of the bridge where the Duke was quick to meet the colourful civic ladies and other honoured guests sent to receive him, until the magic moment came when the Queen herself would make that first historic crossing following her gates at walkabout. After her meeting with the public, accompanied by the Lord Lieutenant of Tyne and Weir and the Mayor of Gateshead, Councillor Joseph Hatton, the Queen repeated a ceremony carried out by her grandfather 73 years earlier, by opening the very latest bridge to cross the River Tyne. Tyneside's latest landmark weighing 850 tonnes and costing £22 million to build takes just four minutes to move in either direction. Once on the Newcastle side, Her Majesty is reunited with Prince Philip and together they mix with the Geordie population some of whom have waited many hours just to be part of this very special day.
That completes our look at three of Newcastle's most interesting areas. And as you have seen, the quayside still attracts its many visitors. And not just for the Sunday market. Come down here on New Year's Eve and there will be even more people, all willing to wish you a Happy New Year. Cheers. Come with me, my bonny lass, and see you will be mine, and stay forever with me here, down by the banks of the time, down by the banks of the time. And say you will be mine And stay forever With me here Down by the banks of the time Down by the banks of the time